Extended, extended business hours with a 24-hour client support center. Hello and a warm welcome to Captains of Industry. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. In the hot seat this week is the co-founder and group chief executive officer of Aspen Pharmacare, Stephen Saad. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us in studio. I'm just looking at the story unfold and I see 27 periods of uninterrupted growth. That's enough to take anyone's breath away. No, it is. It's, uh, it's quite unbelievable to, to think I've been here for 27 <laughs> periods of reporting. Um, but, you know, life's a bit of a treadmill here. People often say, you know, if you have a champagne to toast the success of Aspen. I mean, Aspen, when we were issued our shares, were, was 50-something cents, 53 or 56, I can't remember, and it's over 100 rand. But the reality is it's a bit like sport. You're only as good as your next period. So the focus is on the 28th period and the 29th and the 30th. So, so that's where all our focus is at the moment. In terms of South Africa, this has been a tougher period than most. And you had two drugs that went post-patent, yes. two of your biggest drugs, yes. and also the ARV tender. The Americans came in and scuppered that up a bit, didn't they? <laughs> Are those all once-off issues? You, you now back on a solid footing in South Africa? Well, we, we did what we do best. You know, we, you know sometimes in life you've got to ex you get curve balls thrown at you and you've, it's how you, you execute in that. And I've always said that's been one of the strengths of Aspen is that we work with a bit of passion. You can have all the best laid plans in the world, but nothing can prepare you or your business for that type of shock. And it's how you recover. So on the two products you referred to, well, the generic products or the, the substitute products we brought out now are now larger or as large as what we had before, so that's fine. And on the uh, ARV tender, um, you've probably seen the publicity. Uh, the health minister also said, you know, thank you to Aspen for, for coming in and stepping in to fill the breach here. And our ARV turnover is back to where it was. So we've, we've dealt with the problems. We, they're behind us. And in fact, we're stronger for them and we've, we've substituted them. And so we we stronger. The globalization of the group, that is now firmly underfoot. And I go back to discussions we had when you first announced that you were going to be purchasing Sigma. The merchant bankers were anti this move. It was far too expensive. You were paying far too much. Well, now, are you saying I told you so? Well, we were paying far too much. They were right. Um, I mean, I often see the parallel between Sigma and South African druggists. I remember the analysts telling us for South African druggists it was like the mouse swallowing the elephant and there's only one thing that happens when that, I remember all of that. And when it came to Sigma, it was something very, very similar. The key difference was the acquisition of South African drugs. We had limited of our own infrastructure and so we had limited synergies except execution. We were going to execute on our plans for South African drugs. Sigma was something completely different. Here we had, we had an infrastructure, we had a capability, a global capability that we developed. Here was, and we did our completely thorough due diligence. Nothing at, that we've done at Sigma happened without a plan. It wasn't oh luck. Um, so yes, we absolutely right. We did overpay. That business was in liquidation. I remember an analyst, an analyst telling me it's a spotty dog. And yes, it was. And yes, it could have, could have been liquidated. But we saw the opportunity in it. I mean, the bottom line is that I think it made just over $70 million of, of EBIT. And we're literally going to double that in a year. And, and, and it's got more growth to come. And that's because, yes, there were similarities with South African drugs, but not only did we execute, but we also had capabilities. We had bigger procurement, we had facilities that we could bring the products into, and a damn good team in Australia. I mean, the same team that started Aspen in 2001. Is it the reality now that one in seven scripts is being written for Aspen products, Asc can, Aspen medicine? Can you believe it? We are the, the most scripted brand in Australia at the moment. So it's a fantastic achievement. And the two guys that we started with, Trev and Greg, um, they're still with us today, and they started a business with a billion dollars. It was a complete starter. And at the, at the time, uh, it was the Lejeunet, the gym groups, and everyone failed in Australia. People said people in South Africa fail in Australia. And so we only started with two people, two laptops. And of course, what happened to us on day one was we lost a whole fixed assets because the laptops got stolen. So <laughs> that was our start. So no Australia. more fixed assets. No more fixed assets, just two, two guys. And so... It's that, it's that business that we started from very humble beginnings and it's grown like that in the period. And I was interested in your strategy there with regard to your reps in that you hired people that were retired post 60. Yes. And this won over the market. Tell me how you came up with that. You know, always, I always say you need a plan and then you need, some, you need to be able to deliver on a plan. And when we looked at Australia, and, and sometimes it's very hard, you've got to be really honest in your assessments. What did we really have? 
to sell to the Australian public. So we're big in South Africa, so what? With generics, they've got generics. So how do you break into a market where you've got a, tr a hard market, a regulated market, and you have no differentiation? The trick is you needed to get to sit opposite the doctors. The multinationals retired their workers, uh, their, their, their reps, 60 to 65. We employed those people because, first of all, they wanted to work. They had the energy, they wanted to work. They had the respect of the doctors. What happened, of course, is you walk into the doctor's room, are you going to make a 20-year-old wait or someone who's been there for all this, for, for 40 years, he's called on you? We even had, and I'm not exaggerating, we had someone over 80 who was on oxygen. Now tell me you're going to make him wait and tell me you're not going to script his product. And then last momentum, Bron, and then what happens is that you get the scripts, people say, gee, they're strong, look at them, they're growing all the time. We better partner with them. We better give them additional products. And even the multinationals started to partner with us. And then, of course, you have the credibility of having a great product range now because you've got branded products, generic products, and that's how we, we grew that business. So you need a plan for each market. It's not the same plan. Could you replicate result. that strategy with your reps in other territories? Do you think it would work? It seems extremely clever to me. It could work. It could work. Um, and it will work in some areas, but not in all territories. And each, each area has a different plan. You know, in South Africa, we had a, a completely different plan of how to attack the market. There we were all generic, and generics were a small part of the market, 16% at that stage of the market. And it was very easy to dismiss generics. You just they haven't got the quality. But as soon as we fixed our factories and we put them at FDA approval, and then we made for the multinationals, then no one could point a finger at your quality. You said, but wait, you're making it with the same line as us. So <laughs> it's, it's different plans for different, for, for, for different outcomes. And you can't speak about the pharmaceutical industry without talking about regulation. No. What is regulation like in Australia? Pretty heavy-handed is, is what I've heard. Regulations in pharmaceuticals generally is heavy-handed. And when, as soon as you want cuts in anything, particularly now with the crisis the world's facing, and in Europe, for example, you just, it's just price cuts, you know, price cuts. Even if you take a South African environment, you get a 0% and a 2% price increase. The reality is the rand is weakening. You're importing. There's no way. What are our biggest drivers of our costs in our factory? Electricity. If I had to go to the unionized workers, I'd say, very sorry, you're going to get a naught and a 2% increase over the next two years. I mean, I'd like to see what would happen outside the gates. It's, so you, you've got to find alternatives and plans to be able to deal with real, real, uh, real problems. Um, our plan has been to grow our volumes. Mm -hmm. Because and it's given us a, ability to procure better, and it's given us and some defence. Uh, it's almost a defensive position against the the regulatory environment with yes. the volumes. Correct, and the volumes are giving us slightly lower costs, and we can convert. So, because there's only so much you can improve your productivity, you can't improve it by the you know 25 percent of the electricity price increase overnight. It doesn't happen. <laughs> Well, let's come, we'll stay on this regulation story and come back to, to South Africa. Do we have further clarity when it comes to regulation in your realm? There's never clarity and there never will be. And this is what I keep trying to explain. Everyone keeps saying, well, there's a regulation and then it ends. I'm absolutely not naive on this. I've been in the industry for a long time. There's, there's been regulation from day one. There'll be regulation forever. It's called managing the regulatory environment, and that's critical. We, we always feel really confident in Aspen is if is that we are making quality medicines affordably. And it's got to be where any regulator wants to go and wants to head. And that's been, you know, that's, so we're strong in the private sector and we're strong in the public sector as well. So we can win tenders as well. So it gives you an idea of our cost. So hopefully we've got that balance right, but you've got to keep watching it and checking it all the time. Talking about making quality medicines, your three-in-one antiretroviral, mm -hmm. is that set to turn the stage when it comes to antiretrovirals? It is. It is and it has. Um, it's already a, a very, very big uh, private market product now. And I would, I'm not sure yet, but I would assume that the next day tenders are going to head down that way as, way as well. So, yes, I think a three-in-one uh, three makes it very simple. It's, I mean, it's, instead of taking three tablets three times a day, one tablet once a day, uh, in environments like South Africa, in any environment, you have that type of compliance. You know, it just makes it that much easier. Not sitting there, oh, I miss my lunchtime by an hour, and I, I better get there at seven o two for my, you know, my evening tablets. It's a, it's a, it's really is a, it's a, it's a game changer, I think, for for patients. Stephen, I've been doing a, a lot of travelling on the Ant uh, on the African continent uh, at this point, and I'm bubbling over with excitement over the African story, having also just spent a week at the World Economic Forum in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Africa is a big part of your story. Yes. Do you see unlimited growth here? I see very strong organic growth. So if, if we look at our other continents that we really focused on, if you take Latin America or Asia, there, there are acquisitive opportunities. 
But I don't think that in any of the geographies that we're involved in, there's the same level of organic growth. And sure, the bases are small. But, you know, people say, oh, if we don't grow 15 or 20 percent, you know, it's just those type of, you know, we're not doing well in our industry. So I, I think that the, the African continent has got huge opportunities um, in terms of organic growth. The negatives on the, uh, on, on the continent for me are the regulators because, or the lack of regulatory supervision. So you end up dealing heavily in things like counterfeit. Um, the lack of quality comes in, and it's, it's those type of things which we're trying to manage. And it's not always easy in some of the bigger economies. You know. If you look at your geographic spread right now, you've <coughs> got LATAM, as you mentioned, Asia Pacific and Africa. Look at the group five years from now. How do you think that'll be skewed in, in terms of representation? I think that um, Australia probably next year will be bigger than South Africa in, in sales. I see you've been quoted yeah. as saying that. It probably will be. I mean, a lot depends on exchange rates, but I just see that this year it's very, it's very even and there's some, there's some opportunities. Remember in South Africa, we've got, you know, we've got very big market shares. So we are, we are hamstrung by acquisitive, in acquisitive opportunities. We've, it was a big play for us in Asia. We've, really, we've rolled out now our office in uh, the Philippines. In Manila, we've got over 100 reps, and that's just grown. I mean, the, uh, the lady that ran it there, Ace, she's unbelievable. I call her Miss, Miss Philippines, and she, she's unbelievable. She just says, uh, Steve, I understand how this group works, and I'm very lucky I've got a little baby, because little babies double their weight each year for the first few years. I said, well, I'm glad you understand Aspen culture. <laughs> now you know what we need of you. So, and she has, and literally it's an operation that's gone from $3 million to $20 million. You know, that's their plan. So it's a, it's, a, and now we're rolling out in Malaysia, Thailand, um, and we've got, you know, we're doing something similar across Africa as well. So, are you difficult equally geographies. excited about all of the geographies? It sounds as though you've got the enthusiasm for across the board. I, ha I am. I think if I have to tell you the geography, I have the most excitement for it's Latin America. Um, the tough markets of so Venezuela, it's, oh no, Brazil. It's, it's they really are. I mean, I could enthrall you with absolute horror stories of what we've seen and found in there. But you know, I love those markets that are difficult to enter because it's just a barrier to entry for others. And they are incredibly difficult to enter those markets um, and to be successful. And you know, people will hug you and tell you you're your very best friend and then you've got to be really cautious. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Latin America for sure is, it's just the, the number of people and they, they have really the, the wealth, the, the growing wealth in that, in that part of the world is quite incredible to see. We're going to a short commercial break, more with Aspen's Stephen Saad when we return, don't you go away.